In the early 16th century, an Augustinian friar, while studying God's holy scripture, was brought to realize that the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church to which he belonged had become plagued with man-made thoughts, abandoning what holy scripture actually proclaims. Moved by God Almighty, the Reverend Martin Luther would write his 95 theses in the hope that they would begin a discussion to return to the truth of God's word. To get the attention of the clergy who would gather for the Festival of All Saints the following day, Luther would nail his 95 theses to the town church doors in Wittenberg, Germany on October 31, 1517. Through such an act by the grace of God, a reformation took place with regards to properly understanding God's word. Much care would eventually be directed toward the proper exposition of the central teaching of God's holy scripture, justification. Now, 500 years after the Lutheran Reformation of the Church, it is appropriate to evaluate how this teaching of justification continues to be handled, and more so, that this all-important teaching remain clear. It's important that we have a right understanding of what we're speaking of when we're talking about the doctrine of justification because there's a lot of confusion that's introduced. When we speak of justification, we're speaking of the individual being counted as righteous before God, with the Lord not counting their sins against them. And this is something which we understand from Scripture and which we then confess in our Lutheran confessions is something which happens by the grace of God through faith, and that faith being something which the Holy Spirit works and sustains in the Christian. Justification is God's courtroom pardon. It's God's judicial act in which he declares a guilty sinner to be innocent, to be righteous, to be holy in his sight, all for the sake of Christ Jesus alone, to whom the guilty sinner has fled in faith for refuge. The proper definition of justification is that God declares sinners righteous when they flee to Christ in faith, when they look to Christ as their mediator, as their uh, redeemer from sin, uh, when they feel the sting of the law so that they are convicted of their sins and that they sorrow over their sins. They flee to Christ uh, and believing the promises of the gospel, then the Lord declares them to be righteous, uh, forgives their sins cancels their debt, uh, absolves them so that those sins are no more, and that they, instead of having their unrighteousness, now have Christ's uh, perfect merits and His righteousness. The focus on justification is something which we find throughout all of Holy Scripture. This was the question from the garden where when we see in our first parents their transgression, their fall into sin, their need for forgiveness from the Lord on account of a sin which deserves death. And so although the language of justification, the use of the term justification, um, is something which we find a greater emphasis on in certain areas of Scripture than others, nonetheless it's the consistent concern of the believer throughout all of human history. And certainly in terms of very clear discussions of forensic justification, we find them enunciated in uh, Paul's epistles as inspired by the Holy Spirit. But Christ himself speaks of justification and of, the, of a person being justified before God. And this has been the concern of Christians, whether they are of the Old Testament or of the New, and will be till the end of the world. The doctrine of justification is not just taught by Paul himself as if somehow he read something into Christ. Uh, this has been the teaching of the Holy Scriptures uh, from the beginning. Yeah, really, the doctrine of justification is something that's taught throughout the Old Testament as well as the New. Uh, even if we look at the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, it's specifically stated there as well and confessed that the prophets uh, also were looking towards the Christ that he would be the object of their faith. 
and, and indeed was. Although the word may not necessarily be used all throughout the scriptures, uh, it, it's a teaching that, that saturates the entirety of the scriptures. How can one who has become conscious by God's law of his sin, his need for forgiveness, if he might stand before the living God, how that forgiveness comes to the individual. Justification is really the central teaching of the whole Bible. So it's been around since the book of Genesis and, and all the way onward. Um, Genesis 15, verse 6, Abraham believed the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. That's an example of justification by faith. It said that Abraham believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness. It wasn't he just believed the Lord, for instance, that when he would leave Ur and go where the Lord told him, but rather the promises that were made of salvation as well. So that Abraham was not looking to himself, but to his descendant for salvation. St. Paul refers back to that in Romans chapter 4 and reminds us this is how God justifies guilty sinners, justifies the ungodly by faith. Uh, and so you can even look back to the Old Testament and see all sorts of different examples of uh, sinners being justified, being declared righteous by God, not because of their works and their merits, but simply because they take God at His word and believe His promises, that He promises to redeem them, promises to save them, promises to forgive them. Look at Moses and the bronze snake in Numbers. That's a clear teaching of how God forgives and justifies looking forward to Christ's fully atoning sacrifice. Moses, at God's directive, puts a bronze snake on a pole, but does it stop there? Is there an implied everybody is now already forgiven and justified understanding? Does God's word express it there? No. Again, at God's directive, Moses tells the people to stare at the very thing that was killing them, just as Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin, is the object of faith. It's only those who actually look who are rescued. There isn't any general justification. They weren't told to trust in an idea or trust that they were already forgiven and justified. It's those who hear God's directive and are brought to trust in His promise as they stare. And then go forward from Genesis, the entire sacrificial system of the Old Testament was set up so that the Israelites could atone for their sins, not themselves, but by bringing a sacrificial animal whose blood was spilled for them. And then, as a result, God forgave those who brought those sacrifices. So the whole sacrificial system was really teaching justification. You have uh, Hebrews 11, the chapter on faith, in which it talks about uh, Abel, uh, Noah, Moses, Abraham, all of these, uh, that it is by faith that we are righteous before God. And so this has been the gospel message that has been proclaimed from the beginning. And then Jesus himself, though he didn't use the word justify or justification very often, at least in the context of the article of justification, um, talks about it all the time. And, and it's as simple as John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then it goes on. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. And that's just a different way of saying is justified, is declared innocent or righteous by God. And it still goes on further. But he who does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's only begotten Son. And so there's some are justified. They're justified by faith. Others who don't believe in the name of God's only begotten Son stand condemned or are not justified before God.
the Reformation's whole basis was the article of justification. When you come down to the teaching of indulgences that Rome was doing and Johann Tetzel going throughout Germany and saying that when the coin in the coffer would ring, then the soul from purgatory would spring, that was something that was easily understood to be contradicting the need and the sufficiency uh, the need for and sufficiency of Christ. You could say justification again, just as it's the central theme of the Bible, was also the central theme and the motivating force behind the Reformation. Luther's primary question was, how does a sinful man become righteous before God? How is a sinner accepted by God? And of course his conclusion was with scripture, by faith alone. This is what's really intriguing. When we think about the, the Reformation, it's best to think in terms of Reformations in the plural. Because while the Lutheran Reformation is focused very significantly on the question of justification, that is less of a concern, for example, in um, the Zwinglian Reformation and with uh, various other groups among the Anabaptists, later with the Calvinists, etc. The Lutherans are focused on the doctrine of justification because they see this as the primary source of Roman Catholic error, uh, which had to be addressed at the time of the Reformation and continues to need to be addressed to this day. So it was in all of the Reformation from the very beginnings, Luther's fighting against indulgences and uh, paying money as a way to, to buy forgiveness of penalties, but it's also a part of the sacrifice of the Mass. It's a part of prayers to the saints and hoping that the saints will share some of their merits with us so that we can be justified and helped in this world. It became you would be justified by your own suffering or by your own working or, and so on. And really that became the Roman doctrine of justification anyway, that rather than it being something where God would impute to you the righteousness of Christ, He would instead infuse that righteousness to you and you would then earn the imputation. So the infused grace would then move your conduct to be that which would earn you a declaration of righteousness so that it wasn't so much on the basis of Christ but on the basis of you. Thanks be to God, the discovery revealed to Luther and fought for by the other Lutheran theologians was a proper focusing off of what you do and on to what Christ did. It was justification by grace alone for the sake of the fully atoning merits of Christ Jesus alone through faith alone. The failure of the other reformations to focus on the central issue of scriptural teaching demonstrates the reason why so many of those other reformations have uh, been fatally flawed in terms of their reform of the teaching of the church. The basis of Christ's atonement, of Christ crucified, of Christ being the mercy seat to which sinners flee in order to be forgiven and justified, that is the biblical doctrine that was being reestablished in the Lutheran Reformation. This is one of the reasons why you see uh, the Lutheran Reformation come out of the context of reform regarding the means of grace. Uh, 1517, we, we begin with a discussion of the doctrine of absolution, because that's the issue involved in indulgences. And from the very beginning then, the Lutheran focus, as is the scriptural focus, is how can the sinner, sinner be justified in the sight of God? And so therefore, Luther returns to the concern for pastoral confession and absolution. Because Luther, as all of the Lutheran reformers do, understood that this is something which comes to the sinner. There's a need for forgiveness of sins, to receive the means of grace and thus be counted as righteous before God. And the indulgences distracted uh, believers from where their concern needed to be. And this is why when there was the issue between Luther and Zwingli, for example, over the Lord's Supper, why the matter of the Lord's Supper was so of uh, such great concern to Luther and the other Lutheran reformers because what was at stake was a divinely instituted means of grace. In other words, through this sacrament, the forgiveness of sins come to us. And so therefore, if we corrupt or neglect the sacrament, it calls that forgiveness of sins into question or doubt. It's, it is a matter of 
doing all things according to Christ's institution. But also, the reason why that's the focus is, this is the means through which the Lord forgives sins. So it always comes back to justification. And that's why there is such tension between the various reformations, is precisely because they move in unscriptural directions which take the practice of the church away from that which Christ has instituted. And Luther and his, those who worked with him were all concerned with returning to a right understanding of justification and that the implications of that aspect of doctrine then for everything which the church does and teaches. Well, you can't expect the devil to give in on the central theme of the Bible and really of the entire plan of salvation that God has, has made for us. So no, the devil kept attacking the doctrine of justification, um, sometimes during Luther's lifetime, and then between the years of Luther's death, 1546, and the Book of Concord in 1580, there were three or four or more different subtle attacks on justification from different angles. All parties concerned continue to react against the Lutheran theology confessed in the Book of Concord, with uh, the Calvinists with their concern for a double predestination in which justification becomes almost an addendum to the doctrine of predestination. Uh, whereas for the Papists, you continue to have this curious mix of divine action and human action, the focus of which will vary according to their argument and their audience at the moment. And so sometimes you will have them saying things which can sound very Lutheran, but are intended to introduce some aspect of work for the human who is being justified. Um, and this is before we even get to the issue of the Arminians, where you then get into a decision theology where God has done his part, but all that's necessary is for us to do our you know, small work, which is usually even uh, narrowed down to the point of um, uh, faith itself being a human work as opposed to a divine work in man, which is worked by the Spirit through the Word. Those were taken care of in the Book of Concord, in the Formula of Concord in 1577, and then published in the Book of Concord in 1580. The assaults continue, but in the Lutheran Church, the confession among the Orthodox Lutheran Fathers remains quite consistent and unvarying. Um, it's just simply a matter of uh, addressing the various heresies as they arise and as false teachers seek new ways to defend their anti-scriptural teaching. So on uh, the side of, uh, of Rome, it was being attacked. Now, uh, years later then, you also see it being attacked from within, uh, even from within the University of Wittenberg faculty. There was a man who came along in the 1590s. His name was Samuel Huber. He was a Calvinist to begin with, but then he realized that Calvinism had a major problem. Calvinism taught that Christ didn't die for everyone that he only died for the elect whom God chose in eternity to be saved and all those other people God chose in eternity to be damned and so he never sent his son to die for that large group of people. And Huber eventually realized that that wasn't biblical so he taught very strongly that Christ did indeed die for everyone and was influenced by the Lutherans and eventually came to Wittenberg and came into the Lutheran uh, University there. And he began to teach together with the Lutheran University professors, Egidius Hunius, Polycarp Leiser, and others. When Huber was brought in as a professor, the thought was, here's someone who has come out of this background and that will help us in presenting the gospel clearly in such a way as to help combat those errors. Huber taught well for a while and they praised him for his emphasis on Christ dying for all men because of course we Lutherans believe that. But then they started to notice some quirky things in his doctrine that they had never heard before. Like Christ had elected all men to salvation 
in a general election. And then there was also a particular personal election that comes along later for each individual. And together with that, he also taught this thing that he called a general justification or a universal justification. Those are his terms. In addition to a particular or a personal justification that comes along through the gospel when a person believes. Huber's doctrine was certainly one which uh, ran the danger of influencing the Lutheran Church, given the prominence of the position which had been given to uh, this converted uh, Calvinist who had then joined the faculty at the University of Wittenberg. In refuting this, Hunius and the rest of the Wittenberg faculty had to point out step by step the variety of errors that took place there. It was Egidius Hunius himself who went after Huber primarily. And Hunius, of course, the Book of Concord was 1580, and then in the 1580s following that, Calvinism was starting to creep into some of the German territories secretly. And it was Hunius himself who was chosen to go and, and root out the Calvinism from the German territory where the Lutherans were. And he was successful at that. So it was at the same time as Martin Chemnitz um, when he was writing and when he was uh, alive still. And then it was just into the 1590s when Huber came to Wittenberg to begin teaching, and within about two years, it was clear that he was teaching these false doctrines as well. The point that they recognize in Huber is that Huber is teaching that at some point prior to the present, and I, in other words, not in the lifetime of the sinner, there's a justification which has taken place for all human beings. And that just as in some of the modern controversies over justification, they will debate whether or not that general justification occurred at the moment of Christ's death, or whether it was something which occurred at the moment of his resurrection. So for Huber, it really doesn't matter whether it was something which happened as a general justification when the gospel is first proclaimed in Genesis 3.15, or whether it is something which happened at some indeterminate point in between that point and the crucifixion, or whether it happened at the time of Christ's death upon the cross, what matters for Huber, and for all those who hold a, a doctrine similar to his, is that it doesn't happen, it being justification, does not happen during the lifetime of the sinner, but something which has already happened and happened for everyone. The faculty at Wittenberg couldn't take these other doctrines that Huber was teaching, this general election and this general justification. So they tried to get him to conform his words, his speech, and his teaching to the pattern of sound words that the Lutherans had developed in the confessions of the Lutheran Church and that the Church had believed and that the Scriptures teach, but he wouldn't. He doubled down and insisted, no, no, everyone has been elected in a general way and everyone has been justified in a general way. So after he wouldn't back down from his doctrine, they had to debate him, and finally they had to expel him from Wittenberg for his false teachings. They returned to a restatement of the teachings of Holy Scripture as enunciated in the Book of Concord, very clearly explain, explained there, and again confess that truth over against the enumerated errors of Simon Huber, because once his doctrine is clearly stated, it wasn't hard for them at all to simply identify the fact this was clearly at variance from what Scripture teaches and from what the Lutherans had been very clearly confessing. And it actually brings the controversy to a fairly speedy conclusion because it was readily evident that his doctrine was not faithful. The most important thing in the whole thing is not exactly what Huber taught because people argue about the details of it. He didn't leave us all these volumes describing what his doctrine was. The most important thing to me is the response of the Lutheran Church to Huber, which simply said, we have never heard in the Lutheran Church of any other justification except for the one that is by faith. And we've never heard of a general election of all people either. So it was this teaching that we don't know about any justification except by faith. And we don't know of another way for sinners to be justified except by the imputation of Christ's righteousness to them. And we know of no other way for that to happen but by faith.
So the simple Lutheran teaching was really emphasized by Aegidius Hunius against Huber and really against anyone who teaches another justification except for the one that is by faith. Of course, as Lutheranism came to the, the United States, things were kind of unsettled among those who first got here. Lutheranism being a minority religion kind of got integrated in with everything else and started taking chunks and pieces from whatever all else it found trying to fit in. Lutheranism came over to the United States in different waves from different places in Germany and formed different groups throughout the country. So there was no single coming over of Lutheranism into America. One of the things you have to understand with the context of the Lutheran Church coming into North America is that many of those who were involved in the immigration were uh, caught up in the doctrines of pietism, which immediately means you're looking at a context of an influence of Arminian theology um, in interaction with um, certain Calvinist presuppositions. But primarily, um, it's a matter of uh, looking for a, a growing sanctification in the life of the sinner as the proof of their justification. So there was clearly pietism everywhere in Europe and in the new land of America. But to bring it back to justification coming to America, although we cannot historically trace a preservation of the Huberian false teaching, specifically in the Norwegian and German homelands, in America there are two historically documented findings of Huber's universal objective justification being reawakened. One is when the Saxon Germans arrive and CFW Walther begins to lead and to teach. With Walther, we can see, for instance, in his Law and Gospel, that he constantly confesses that he's still trying to overcome what being under the Pietists had caused. And so early on already in the 1850s, 1860s, uh, Walther was starting to preach about this universal justification. He didn't have a word for it yet, but where all sinners, all people, all of you, as he preached on Easter Sunday, all of you were justified, were declared righteous 1,800 years ago from his time frame. And that teaching, he didn't have a name for it. It seems right now uh, at the beginning because we don't really know the history of objective justification since it's not a Lutheran teaching. What's truly bewildering to me is that we have historically this same false teaching of justification espoused by Huber and shot down by the early Lutheran fathers, and yet Walther puts forth this same Huberian heterodoxy and nobody questions him? Was nobody reading the early Lutheran fathers? Not even Walther? Walther, for all intents and purposes, was the leader, the esteemed leader of the Missouri Synod in the 1850s, 60s, 70s. And as far as I know, no one argued with him too heavily about his teaching of everyone having already been justified on Easter Sunday. Um, whether they did or not, I don't know, but no one was able to successfully oppose him in that teaching. And it seems that the churches that followed him went along with what he taught. The other historically documented finding of Huber's false teaching being reawakened is through an event called the Absolution Controversy. We do know that in the Absolution Controversy of the 1850s, 60s, 70s, that H.A. Uh, Preuss was the president of the Norwegian Senate. He had a couple of professors who uh, pietistic leanings, in which America, we've been dealing with pietism since we, Lutheranism has been here. Uh, these two professors denied absolution. They said you can't uh, have the forgiveness of sins being given out with any effect. Uh, it, uh, you don't, can't see faith, and so you, therefore you can't do this. 
Pietists sadly don't want to believe in the power of the means of grace, which are God's Word and His Word-empowered sacraments of holy baptism, holy absolution, and holy communion. Those means pastors are equipped with, and yet it's the Holy Spirit who is doing the effective work through those means. Pietists, however, want to look to themselves for a renewal of some kind for proof of salvation. When these two professors denied absolution, uh, what they're really denying is, is the efficacy of the Word of God. That is, they're denying that uh, God's Word, which tells pastors that they are to forgive sins, uh, that this can truly happen. Because of the pietistic influence um, and the the concern over how sins are forgiven, there is an um, effort to diminish the significance of pastoral absolution as something through which sin is forgiven. So Preuss decided that he would uh, make a response to this. Uh, his response is objective justification in which he says, oh yes, the pastor can pronounce absolution because the world is already absolved. The world is all justified. And since everybody's justified, you don't have to look at faith. And you can just tell everybody that they're, they're justified objectively. Preuss, possibly attempting to get the pietists to stop looking to their feelings, Preuss actually swings too far in the other direction by stating, you don't even have to believe. Everybody is already forgiven, absolved, justified, apart from faith. H.A. Preuss should have told them, you know, you're denying the efficacy of the Word of God instead of creating a, a false doctrine to, uh, to deal with it. This revival of Huberian justification was completely unnecessary. If they would have focused on the means of grace as they should have, then this never would have taken place. So in responding to the professors, H.A. Uh, Preuss declares that the whole world is righteous and thus says objective justification is the thing that they need to trust in, as if that can be the ground, something they always say, something has to exist for you to kind of give it out, for you to declare it. Uh, the problem is, is there's already something that exists. <laughs> It's called the atonement of Jesus Christ. And so uh, by denying that the atonement itself uh, is, is not enough, that you have to declare some kind of objective justification, that you have to go beyond this, uh, is to subvert the scriptures. The Wisconsin Synod's teaching of it did differ from Walther's teaching. And, and I think we have to recognize that there are various versions of objective, subjective justification floating around in 19th, early 20th century America. Walther teaches a supposed justification by God, which isn't found in Holy Scripture, that forensically declares that all of sinful humanity has already been forgiven, absolved, justified, apart from faith. But faith is needed in order to become forgiven, absolved, and justified. And if you don't believe, then you're not forgiven, absolved, or justified, even though they just doctrinally stated that God's Holy Scripture says that you are objectively. It makes complete sense. The Wisconsin Synod version was, was different in that to the Wisconsin Synod, objective justification, or as they like to use the term, universal justification, really was God's justifying act, his single justifying act of mankind when Christ died on the cross. Because when Jesus said, it is finished, the Wisconsin Synod interprets that to mean all people are justified. All people are declared righteous, believers and unbelievers alike, even the souls in hell. So the Wisconsin Synod views that justification at the cross of Christ as God's pronouncement that all men are forgiven, all men are justified. And subjective justification to them is simply being able to participate in the benefits of having already been justified. Now you get to go to heaven. 
Uh, neither the Wells nor the Missouri Synod has ever taught that unbelievers end up in heaven. What they have taught, though, is that God has declared all people, including unbelievers, righteous.